Hello everyone at Vivid. How are you? My name is Theo Priestley and I'm really pleased to be giving this keynote today on The Future Is Now. Firstly, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm Theo. I'm a technology futurist. Uh, I've worked with some large companies like uh, SAP uh, and Software AG, who you may have heard of before. Uh, I've given a TED conference uh, talk on artificial intelligence, and I'm a regular keynote speaker at um, technology and business events. I've also got a book coming out uh, next year in April called, uh, funnily enough, the same title, The Future Is Now, um, which is uh, co-authored by a friend of mine called Bronwyn Williams. And we uh, examine the impact on business, uh, technology and society um, uh, in terms of what's coming up next and how it's going to impact us all. Now, I want to paint a bit of a uh, what I call a simple healthcare example, uh, just to give a flavour of um, what I see coming up in the future, um, in the near future, in the next five to 10 years, and how it's going to impact our lives, but also make you think about the kinds of technologies and the intersection of the technologies and the industries that we need to think about to build these kind of things. So in this example, say you have actually fallen over in your home, you've perhaps damaged your hip in a really bad way. The chances are you're going to have a smart device or in the home there will be a multitude of embedded smart devices uh, around your um, around your house this will pick up uh, the injury that you've had and it will actually relay that information uh, to a surgeon and to your electronic medical records in real time for diagnosis the chances are you'll be speaking um, uh, to an AI assistant about uh, what has happened. It'll be relaying some information back to you um, and you'll be booked in for a particular type of surgery, in this case, a hip operation. To give you a new hip, you obviously need a, a, a 3D printed um, uh, replacement. Uh, that replacement will actually have embedded biosensors in it uh, and it will be rep um, a replacement that is tailored to you before you even arrive. So the chances are in the future uh, you will have a full body scan internally and externally um, and it will be recorded on your medical records and so it will be and every time you go for some kind of treatment or a hospital surgery uh, the chances are is that they know exactly what to give you. Um, in this case a brand new hip embedded with biomedical sensors, those sensors will be able to relay in real time um, your convalescence, for example, and all your biomedical signatures uh, back to your medical records. Again, um, we're looking forward into the future, although a not too distant future, because uh, robotic surgery is a thing. Um, we've seen examples um, of uh, robots actually doing neurosurgery faster than uh, human surgeons. So human surgeons uh, take around six hours plus to perform neurosurgery. Uh, robots can actually perform this surgery um, a lot faster. Um, so the chances are, again, human will be relegated to some kind of supervisory role, um, even after spending around 10 years in the medical school um, and uh, basically letting a, a robot perform the surgery for you. Getting you to and from a hospital um, is going to be a little bit easier. You don't have to wait on someone actually coming to your home. Um, there will be scheduled autonomous transports um, to basically pick you up from your home and drop you off at the hospital. And again, once you have actually finished uh, at the hospital and your surgery uh, to take you back home. And the chances are at home, you will be assigned a personal assistant, but a physical one this time to actually physically take care of you. Um, the, done trials in um, Japan, as you can see in this cuddly robot there taking care of this uh, this young patient here. Um, but uh, the, the chances are for some more extreme surgeries and for some more extreme uh, convalescence uh, medical treatments, there will actually be a robotic um, assistant as well as a, a human nurse or visitor uh, who comes in and checks on you. All of this information um, in terms of your biomedical uh, information from your, your hip replacement and the sensors there relayed to your uh, smart assistants or digital assistants in the home um, will be given uh, straight to your GP um, and analysed through algorithms and machine learning to basically see where your uh, recovery period is against uh, society norms, uh, regional norms, national norms. So you can you can see that the algorithms will adjust your medication, for example, according to how well you're responding to the treatment. 
And that information in turn will actually be passed to utilities companies and insurance companies in real time to basically adjust your uh, rates. So uh, your utility bills should actually come down because you should be put on a preferential rate because you're actually trying to convalesce. So you'll be using more electricity, but they know there's a reason behind that. Um, so they want to treat you better for that. And this, all of this holistically um, is supposed to lead us to a better life. Now, I say that this was a simple healthcare example, but it's not. Um, if you look at the types of technologies that are in play and the types of industries in play, it's really quite a complex use case example. So you have healthcare, obviously, uh, um, because of providing it. Um, utilities companies, like I said in the example, insurance, uh, pharmaceuticals, because they want to get, actually give you the right drugs for your treatment. Um, automotive industry is in play here because of the autonomous transport. Smart home uh, and, and those kind of devices um, is in play because it was actually the one that diagnosed you and relayed all that information to your medical records. Um, and manufacturing, in this case, 3D printing and the types of technologies in, involved are Internet of Things for the site for the sensors and the smart devices uh, in your connected home, uh, 3D printing obviously again because of the uh, the hip that you had replaced, and not mentioned was virtual and augmented reality. Um, in some cases, uh, a surgeon may elect to uh, perform. Um, the actual physical surgery this time rather than a robot and would wear an augmented reality headset. Um, virtual reality has actually been used for pain relief and uh, for treating uh, patients rather than giving them medication. Um, so this could be an option in the future. Robotics and AI, like I said, the robotic surgeons, robotic healthcare, um, AI and uh, machine learning to actually adjust your uh, pharmaceutical needs, your medical needs, um, and process the medical information that's actually been passed in your health records. Even enterprise resource planning, ERP, the most boring technology on earth probably, um, is in play here because obviously you have to schedule all of this uh, in the right way. You have to uh, procure uh, the services uh, and pay for them. Big data and analytics and cloud, it's all a bit of a given here because of the amount of information that's flying around. Autonomous transport, like I've said, uh, and, and even uh, the, the dreaded word blockchain and smart contracts. In this case, you know, you could tie it to the utilities companies um, and the insurance companies there. But this is anything but a, a, a simple healthcare example. But we have a long way to go. Um, to build these kind of things. Uh, we know for a fact that we have uh, data interdependency uh, regulations that prevent us from sharing this kind of information to build it. Um, the, uh, the bigger hurdle actually, especially in the, U in the UK, and I don't know how many of the audience here are, are based in the UK, but um, a, sur a survey was done a couple of years ago where they, um, they looked at 68 national uh, health trusts um, and found that 94% were still using uh, handwritten notes. Now, how do you capture that information? How do you make sure that that is in uh, an electronic health record to be able to parse that data uh, correctly to you know, utilities companies or pharmaceutical companies um, to enable that kind of uh, overreaching use case? Uh, it's just simply a, a long, long road ahead of us to be able to uh, enable that and it also highlights the, the, the amount of information that's lost as well. You know, that survey basically said that 10,000 patients records were lost or stolen in 2017. Again, how can you build um, a use case, a simple use case like that, where we improve the lives of people through healthcare, knowing that one, uh, 94% uh, still have handwritten and post-it notes attached to them, but two, all that information somehow gets lost one day. Um, so we do have a long way to go to actually build that, but it is a future example that I would love to see come to fruition. Now, one of the things that um, is obvious in a sense is that AI, artificial intelligence, all this technology um, has a, a human impact. And one of the impacts is obviously on leadership. Um, we tend to think of things like the future of work as how it impacts uh, the employee, on, at the employee level, uh, what it means for jobs, um, but at the same time, the future of leadership and the C-suite and, and middle management, for example, are certainly one of the areas um, of an organization that would be affected. And when we see um, 
the, the changes that are required. Um, uh, Mike Walsh was uh, quoted as saying an algorithmic leader is someone who has successfully adapted their decision making um, to deal with the complexities of the machine age. Um, and they display uh, a certain amount of uh, different qualities as it were. Um, certainly someone who not only champions um, AI uh, within the organization, but a leader has to actually act as that bridge um, in a sense, uh, someone who will help th and bring the organization along with working alongside algorithms and uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Obviously, the big impact is how it affects uh, uh, jobs on the, the, uh, within the organization. And certainly it's a, a leader's responsibility to make sure that nobody actually feels out of place, nobody feels displaced or threatened um, and a sense of that. So there's almost a stepping up in terms of empathy, um, in terms of uh, more kind of human qualities that need to be brought to the table in the face of um, a different level of uh, automation uh, being brought into the organisation. And certainly something that has been seen uh, throughout the last sort of 12 months or certainly the last nine months uh, under the pandemic um, are businesses that have been affected um, and, uh, and that affects employees. And if you're in a small business, for example, what we've seen is that people are more than the sum of their job descriptions. So as a, a kind of a le leadership quality in a sense, um, especially with high levels of automation, what we need to sort of understand is it's not just people who are, are the sum of their job descriptions and, and all they do is essentially I'm in finance and that's my silo or I'm in marketing and that's my silo. People are more um, and can offer more and certainly in their careers they've probably have made a couple of changes in the past um, and they have latent skills that they've not used before or not used since they've made those changes um, but they're extremely relevant now especially to the survival of an organization or a business. Um, under a, uh, the conditions of such a thing like a pandemic. So a leader in this sense would have to, I guess, recognize and let people step up to the challenge rather than keep them in their box. Um, and I think we're seeing more and more of that, not just within conditions of, of a pandemic, but I think recognition that people have a lot more skills and can actually rise and adapt faster than what um, uh, what we give them credit for. So hopefully we'll see a lot more of that in the future, especially with um, AI coming into the organization, just giving people that scope to actually challenge themselves and be recognized for it. And certainly, um, you know, I'm not saying that leaders aren't agile or, or don't make decisions in, in fast paced environments. I think what we need to understand now is, especially again, in a situation like this is recognize that the, 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 the decisions that we made so three months ago or six months ago or 12 months ago um, in terms of forward planning uh, may not be uh, relevant for tomorrow. Uh, we need to sort of recognize that we have a bit of humble pie to eat and sort of understand that there's a different level of agility that we need to adapt to now, um, certainly to take into account of um, uh, situations that literally nobody could plan for, especially from a business sense. Um, but it also helps us recognize that are um, business thinking and perhaps our business models that we um, that we relied on in the past, um, we're actually on pretty shaky foundations and the, the pandemic has kind of exposed that. So the AI uh, and certainly adoption of AI and adoption of high automation um, is gonna do exactly the same again. It's gonna expose our businesses for uh, to be either very precarious or very sort of sound. Um, and in that sense, uh, forcing us to re-examine the kind of business decisions that we've made in the past and whether they're relevant in an age of high automation or in an age of AI and certainly <laughs> in an age where pandemics are going to be more rife. And where that um, is pretty prevalent is uh, none other than in China. Um, we've seen um, certainly China is definitely one of the um, countries that uh, adapts and adopts um, New, newer technologies faster than the Western cultures do, um, primarily because they're more open about how they share data. Um, but all that kind of automation allows them efficiencies of scale and economies of scale that uh, we, we kind of sort of shy behind at the moment. But you know, the levels of automation there um, are certainly on, on different levels than we, we've expected. Um, 
when I was across in China, actually, I gave a, a, a keynote and a, a panel discussion at a big data conference, and I actually met the chairman of Foxconn, and we had a bit of argy-bargy in terms of uh, the levels of automation and things like that, but he revealed that um, in, in, in Foxconn itself, um, he was looking to um, displace 60,000 people just through high automation and using robots. Um, and in that particular example, he said that he actually has um, entire factories running in the dark, um, making iPhones because um, they, you know, they don't need people. The people are actually used in the last mile when they turn tiny, tiny screws um, on the motherboards or on the logic boards or, or certainly to pull the, uh, the actual iPhone units together or Samsung units, whichever ones that he was actually contracted to make at that time. But uh, the majority of the manufacturing process was run in the dark uh, with no uh, lights on because it was run by robots. So there was no need to actually waste um, energy and utilities um, in the factory environment in that sense. And that kind of shifts our mindset in terms of if I've got high degrees of automation, then what do I need all this capital expenditure for around me? What do I need all this operational expenditure around me for um, when it's literally being run by either a robot or an algorithm, for example? And uh, this example here actually is, um, it's not Foxconn, but it's a warehouse where these guys, these little orange buddies are basically running around, zipping around um, to uh, be um, in a logistics situation where they're sorting parcels um, for for shipping, um, and they you know they sort twenty thousand parcels per hour. They don't need to take cigarette breaks. They don't need to take lunch. Um, they actually know when they're going to be uh, running out of power, so they find a, a, a power source um, to basically recharge from. So it's 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 incredible if you think about again the the differences in business models and how we treat business and how we treat automation once you actually understand some of the um, knock-on effects and, and intended consequences to that obviously an unintended consequence of Foxconn getting rid of something like 60,000 people um, is an impact on on the economy and the weight of uh, unemployment but at the same time I think the chairman basically saw this kind of balancing act where well I've got massive efficiencies of scale as a result of that whether it's ethical is another question. So on that kind of subject of uh, losing jobs and high automation, yet the robots are coming for our jobs. So everyone says, if you read uh, McKinsey or Forbes or HBR or World Economic Forum, they've got massive amounts of reports um, that basically detail which jobs are coming, you know, job creation and job de destruction, um, new jobs that have never been thought of before, because of this high automation and because robots are coming. Um, I want to point out that obviously in this scenario, a robot is not literally a walking, talking automaton, but an algorithmic um, piece of software that will actually automate some functions. Um, we're not going to see uh, people at customer service desks in a branch, for example, in a bank, uh, replaced by um, ro robotic dinosaurs. This is actually a robotic dinosaur uh, front desk uh, sales uh, service assistant in a hotel for check-in. So um, it is a bit quirky, it's quite funny actually, but we're not going to see that in the high street anytime soon, thankfully. But what kind of jobs are um, affected? Well, I mean, anything that has a high degree of uh, manual processing and I guess number crunching in a sense. Um, computers are very good at crunching numbers. Uh, computers are very good at following logic patterns. Um, and outcomes so and um, structure so things like actuaries where there's a lot of number crunching involved I see you know those jobs being affected by algorithms because they could do them a lot faster accountants for example well accountants prepare statements that are based on very strict kind of formats uh, very strict guidelines. Um, it's all about number formatting as well, uh, making sure everything is uh, uh, numerically correct and financially sound you could program an algorithm to do uh, a lot of these kind of sort of things. Lawyers, um, lawyers have actually been proven to use um, algorithms to essentially search uh, pre-existing case files for um, commonalities. Um, and they can do that a lot faster with software that can literally rip through tens of thousands of uh, uh, previous uh, rulings uh, and find where there are gaps and where there are common factors um, in the cases that they're dealing with. 
data scientists and developers, this one's always a bit of a contentious one that I bring up. Um, in a sense, a developer is working to a structured language in a structured syntax in a structured format. Um, it's not a large stretch of the imagination to see uh, a fairly high degree um, of automation happening there. You, we have automation and testing, for example. Um, automated code um, is not a stretch of the imagination. In fact, um, what I've seen um, is a startup where someone has literally drawn a web page and some of the components um, scanned it with an iPad and then the iPad takes a structured format and actually builds the HTML behind it. I can see very much in the case of someone actually verbally describing requirements and system requirements and business requirements to um, a computer one day um, and and the computer would actually come out with a draft of code um, uh, to, to basically as a, as a first stab and then a developer would come along and refine that code. I can see that happening in the next sort of five to ten years. Um, data scientists as well, a lot of number crunching there. Um, I, it's no stretch again of the imagination to think that what was once deemed the sexiest job in, in Silicon Valley maybe about four years ago is probably going to be redundant in four years time. Underwriters again, a bit like actuaries and accountants and lawyers, um, they're looking at facts uh, uh, on a case by case basis. Um, Lemonade was an app uh, that famously hit the headlines a couple of years ago where they um, claimed that uh, someone uh, put in uh, an insurance claim and they processed that claim and then paid out or certainly authorized the, the payout uh, all in the space of three seconds. And that was all done by an algorithm. Call center agents, IVR is really horrible at the moment. We've all seen that, but um, I do see that um, once speech recognition, NLP um, and AI come come a little bit more mature in, in, in spoken word um, and, uh, and analysis of uh, spoken word, I can see first and second level support from call centers uh, being decimated in that, in, in that sense. We certainly do it already through apps. If you bought anything from Amazon, for example, you're talking to a bot and nine times out of 10, if it's a complaint about an item and it's under a certain threshold and certainly you spend a lot of money on Amazon, it makes a decision there and then to basically refund you um, because they just don't want to have the, I guess, hassle um, of dealing with a, a human agent um, when they could actually cut to the chase really quickly. Radiologists, yeah, we've seen examples where radiologists, um, their work is uh, processed a lot faster by using an algorithm to pattern match uh, x-rays. It's not infallible. Um, we've seen, I think, um, Google claims to have done some wonderful work out of that, but the data sets are very small. So therefore, um, it's, it's kind of questionable um, at the moment, but certainly the promise is there. Uh, and again, like I said, you know, the C-suite, the C-suite's under threat in some respects. Um, what Jack Ma said about the next 30 years, I can very much see um, happening very quickly. And none of this is really possible without actually understanding what kind of data we have. Um, in order to do this, we need to sort of open up our data, uh, make it less siloed, uh, make sure that it's actually cleansed and clean for purpose. Um, a lot of information out there is, is just dirty. It's just, um, it just doesn't work. It would not work. Um, it's the old garbage in, garbage out adage from back in the 70s and 80s, um, and it's still prevalent and it's still true today. If you feed an algorithm garbage data, um, it's going to make give you garbage um, answers um, and potentially very damaging answers, whether financially or reputationally, as we've seen. Um, algorithmic bias is going to be here with us for a long, long time. Um, I don't see uh, algorithmic bias ever being removed, to be honest. Um, there's just too much um, bias information out there that it could uh, certainly be fed by accident or discover for itself. But from a, a data quality point of view, we have to do a lot more and we have to kind of sort of step up. Um, I remember um, IDC quoting something like 0.5% of the world's data um, is, is ever analysed in the correct way. Um, and that's quite scary when you think about how many petabytes or whatever, brontobytes, I think it was another number of quotes, or, or zettabytes. Um, 
are floating out there right now, you know, being stored. We're very good at storing information. We're not very good at disseminating it and actually making decisions based on the right sets of information. And if we kind of, sort of take a look at what, how the, how the, the, the nature of analysis is, is moving forward with that information as well, what we're looking at is um, a, a change from descriptive, which is what has happened, which is normally just normal business uh, information or BI reports or MI reports that get printed on PowerPoint and then stuffed in the desk um, to a scenario planning, which is um, what could happen um, if we, uh, you know, um, if a certain scenario happened or, or what the trends telling us, we look at backward trends and then say, well, what can happen um, in the future if something changes? Um, and then what should we do, which is prescriptive analytics uh, it's almost the last mile before we get to uh, real sort of um, AI, uh, fundamental AI. And, and what should we do in that scenario? So when you predict something, um, and you predict a certain event or, or a number of events, prescriptive analytics basically uh, gives you a sample of, well, here are the things that you should be doing if that occurs. And, um, and if you did this particular action, if you took this action to mitigate what was going to happen, this is the likely outcome as well. So this is kind of sort of the thing that, that we really kind of, sort of need to understand and make um, the front of mind when we're thinking about how we want to use data. It's not just a case of data to understand something as it stands now. It's understanding what can happen. And if it does happen, what should we do about it? And what are the likely outcomes? But I'm talking about, um, you know, data and analytics and prescriptive analytics and algorithms driving what we do. At the same time, algorithms are dumb. Computers are dumb. Peter Drucker said computers are moron. Um, it just carries out orders, and that's to a certain extent true. Um, certainly before he understood that AI and machine and deep learning came to being, but um, it just means that um, if we are beholden to specific um, algorithms and specific data uh, and decision making uh, software, it just means that the people uh, in charge of that software, and certainly the people leading the organization dependent on that software, have to step up to another level. So the brighter the master must be, as Peter Drucker says. Um, and it's, it, it's uh, like uh, Michael Porter said, it's, it's strategy is, is choosing what not to do as well as what to do. So if you're presented with a number of scenarios, the computer might think, I'm going to pick this one because it's the most likely one to bring an outcome of success. But the chances are is that if it might not be, um, and there's a lot of um, intuition, something that which cannot be uh, factored into an algorithmic decision. So um, it's interesting that um, I've seen uh, surveys done by Deloitte and PwC where uh, only 35% of executives actually trust the organization's data. Now, if that's an, an exec, not trusting the organization's data um, and certainly the quality of the data, then how would they ever trust uh, an algorithm making decisions based on that quality of data? So we have this kind of cyclical problem there. Um, and the other thing as well is that, you know, two thirds of CEOs basically ignored the data and went with their gut um, because it was just something different about it. And I think we cannot Again, we kind of relinquish everything um, in the future to algorithms and to robots to make all the decisions. There has to be a human level, a human checking factor in there, and certainly one that can sort of step back and go, that's not actually the right thing to do. I know another way. Now, I kind of talked about the, uh, the, the future of leadership and the future of uh, jobs, certainly, um, and the impact uh, from sort of algorithms and high automation and things like that. What do we see about the, the future of work, um, the future of work in terms of how work is performed um, and how uh, businesses are going to be structured, organizations are going to be structured? Well, back in 97, uh, um, Valve Software, who made uh, Half-Life at that time, um, were working towards a system called the Cabal, which essentially was agile uh, before agile became formalized. Um, and I remember speaking to Gabe Newell and actually reading a, an article um, about how, how um, Half-Life was produced. 
and certainly the levels of uh, collaboration, um, the, the removal of silos was certainly a massive, massive factor in being successful um, and developing the game um, to the point where people's job roles and job descriptions didn't really exist. Um, Gabe was a big fan of actually removing or certainly mixing people into groups that traditionally wouldn't have uh, been mixed before. So in kind of waterfall structured projects, we have people who gather business requirements. Um, we have people who gather system requirements. We have the developers. Um, uh, we have the testers. Um, um, and we have the UX people and things like that. Whereas Gabe just kind of sort of threw people in into small groups and said, you know, come up with things, let's get on with it. Let's see what happens. And of course, what happened was Half-Life. Um, so there was certainly a, a lot of um, creative thinking around that process, but a lot of success uh, to prove that collaboration actually works really very well. And organizations are, are kind of changing. I mean, this is a bit of a jokey map in a sense. Um, but um, networks are, uh, well, uh, organizations have always been networks of people. I think what we've generally tended to do is actually hide behind formal hierarchy structure. Um, and hierarchy is, is good for one thing, which is uh, what is my job? What is my job title? Um, and essentially it promotes rent seeking. But uh, everything that actually happens underneath that is where the business takes place, where the work takes place. Um, and so what we've found is um, it creates, uh, it's conducive of creating operational silos. Um, so you have people who are in uh, HR, you have people who are in sales and manufacturing and marketing and things like that. And the, uh, and the chances are never the twain shall meet, um, as they say, because it's just not um, needed for their job to perform. But again, it goes back to a lot of the previous slides in terms of the sharing of data, the quality of the data, if we are also focused in on our silos, uh, the chances are that we think our data is fit for purpose and it's fit for, fit for purpose for our particular job, um, but it might not be fit for purpose to actually help someone else do their job. Um, and, and going forward, we have to understand um, and recognize that um, organizations really kind of have to change uh, and their structures have to change and have to be recognized that we are actually a networked and collaborative um, society. You know, as, as a species, we like being sociable, we like being networked, we like to help out um, and we have a very sort of fluid arrangement in terms of how our lives work. Um, it's centered around goals and interests. We are motivated to do things even from a selfish point of view. But if we treat that uh, certainly in, in an organization, we find very much the same is true. Um, I remember a few years back, a uh, tier one bank in the UK actually using emails um, in, a, in a project uh, to mine where the real subject matter experts were. So traditionally, again, we look at hierarchy and we think people with a certain amount of tenure are the subject matter experts. But what we found were that uh, the, that other people were actually subject matter experts because we were able to identify deficiencies in a process and actually come up with workarounds and different solutions and, and shortcuts. Um, and those are the people that are, that this uh, email project was intended to work out because it was uh, it was looking for keywords that sort of said it we're asking for particular help, but avoiding the people in the hierarchy uh, and asking other people down the chain. So. It's important to recognize, even from a human resources point of view, um, who the real experts are in the organization, how they're networked, because they could actually hold a vast amount of sway in the organization and certainly help a vast amount of people over and above what a traditional hierarchy structure would suggest. And it's certainly prominent, especially uh, when we look at surveys. Uh, Deloitte ran a survey and, and found that you know 74% uh, of a certain demographic really want to collaborate. Um, and this was actually before the pandemic hit. And it was really interesting to note that 75% believed that work from home or a work remote policy was important. That certainly is definitely going to rise or has risen um, in, the, in the event of uh, this pandemic and certainly in lockdown scenarios. But um, it's not just collaboration that, uh, that brings an organization forward and certainly promotes um, uh, better business outcomes in a sense. 
an inclusive culture um, can see a rise in uh, collaboration and quality of decision making because you're taking into account different points of view, diverse points of view. Um, and diversity is an intellect multiplier, um, as, as, as the case and, and the quote is actually saying below. But it's not without challenges. Um, the, you know, when we are, you know, I myself I work with a, an organization at the moment that's spread to the four winds. Um, across uh, uh, all four sort of uh, corners of the world um, and we all enjoy the collaboration but we all have different needs from that collaboration and certainly that's uh, seen from a, a, a chart here that um, Slack actually did a, a survey so you know in the UK may have different goals to uh, collaboration in Germany or Japan um, and India have different ones from France and Brazil for example so it's really important to again consider what a diverse uh, a, a, a diverse culture looks like um, and, and, and how to actually make that an inclusive culture at the same time by taking into account what everybody actually wants from uh, want from their job, how to achieve their job and certainly how to collaborate in their job. And going back to that point about uh, the shifting uh, attitudes towards uh, remote working policies and what we see um, First Base, which is a remote working organization uh, that promotes sort of uh, remote working facilities, they see that 40 to 60 percent of companies will abandon their headquarters. And I can see exactly the same. Once you've tasted uh, working from home or a remote work, a remote first policy, um, certainly one that uh, you are not spending a large amount of your week sitting and commuting. Um, then there's a large amount of capital expenditure and operational expenditure to be to be saved by an organization. There's no need to have a, a large headquarters, which I think were used to be the, the kind of status symbol that um, companies strived for. Now they're just going to sit empty, which has a knock on effect in the economy in terms of uh, commercial lands, landlords and leasing um, and commercial property. But at the same time, the money that used to flow out into the big cities is actually being retained by the smaller uh, towns because that's where all the workers are now. So there's a bit of ebb and, ebb and flow there. But at the same time, you know, if 90% of the workforce never want to be full time in an office again, it kind of makes you question the nature of work again. What is the future of work and how are we supposed to perform our jobs? Not every, you know, this is a very privileged position, I guess, that we're in. I'm sitting behind a desk. Um, behind a laptop in my home. Not everyone uh, has that kind of luxury, certainly in a retail environment. So those kind of, you know, the future of work for them may be, there may be no uh, difference. You know, they may have to just uh, turn up to work every day, but in a sense, their jobs are impacted because we're no longer going to work. But it's not just uh, an impact on uh, the economy, uh, on how we work. There's also that impact on the uh, the climate as well um, on our Earth. So, I mean, we're using less energy, we're using less um, electricity um, because we're not actually moving around an awful lot. Um, there's, there could be a net net effect because we're actually spending more electricity in our homes because we're working from there. But at the same time, a commercial property would actually burn a lot more electricity. Um, we're also not commuting, so there's that carbon footprint element that's now being reduced because we're no longer traveling or commuting uh, as much as we did before. So, you know, in this case, you know, what can we say? The US potentially could save 2.7 billion round trips a year, which would be 30 million metric tons of CO2. I live in the UK. What could we achieve in the UK, for example, if we kind of sort of followed this uh, remote working policy as well? And the future of work is obviously enabled by software um, and platforms. And it's a busy, busy marketplace. It's a very lucrative marketplace. Um, but if you look at um, if you look at what's uh, what's available out there, um, it's certainly um, it's going to look a lot more crowded actually in the future. I think um, certainly Silicon Valley's uh, VCs are going to be looking for the next unicorn or certainly the next set of unicorns where we're looking at remote working platforms that support people uh, no matter what their jobs are um, in terms of collaboration, in terms of communication, um, in terms of sharing information, document management, um, experience, building those experiences and content portals. Um, and, and the key, I think, for me is how open those platforms are. 
So, I mean, if you look, take Slack for ex for an exa as an example, I should say, I think there are something like 1,000 um, or certainly 1,200 different integration points that they offer, um, which basically essentially makes them like a centralized platform and everyone else hooks into them. And I see that as a key survival um, of any software platform that comes out or certainly existing ones where um, in order to become uh, a pivotal part of your the future of your work, um, you have to allow people to integrate what tools that they are familiar with into that platform itself. And uh, certainly when we think about how things have changed in the last nine months, or certainly in the last six months, um, it's been an incredible transformation. Um, what has traditionally happened is we uh, plan projects that run for years and, and slowly, slowly catchy monkey, as the saying goes, um, we'll get there at the end. Um, but the pandemic has come along and actually said, well, actually, you've, you need to change um, or your business isn't going to survive. Um, and it's, the, you know, to liken COVID um, and, and the pandemic to um, a, a business critical situation, COVID um, has certainly exposed a lot of business models to being um, extremely fragile. So one that I read uh, today, putting a date stamp on this, <laughs> on this recording actually was um, uh, a VR arcade is basically on the brink of collapse. Uh, quite a famous one in Silicon Valley actually is on, and, and one which has ties to, to Disney um, is on the brink of collapse because it defaulted on a loan already. Um, and it's because basically they, they have no footfall. Um, it's a location-based experience VR uh, arcade. So essentially you're running around with a headset on shooting baddies and zombies and so forth. But at the same time, you know, you have to physically be there. And of course, with COVID, um, one, there's the infection. You can't literally, and lockdown, so you can't actually go go to this. Uh, and two, there's the infection risk in wearing a headset. So you have to continually sanitize all the equipment, which would obviously have an impact on how many um, parties you can run there. That's a really sort of obvious example, but you know, retail is another one where um, smaller businesses, because they've been locked down for six months or so, you know, or, or um, restaurant chains and so forth, um, you know, they've been decimated. Um, seasonal uh, businesses that are literally, you know, closed for six months of the year and then open up for, you know, the winter months because that's where the travel happens in that particular region. Again, completely decimated to the point where a lot of businesses have had to close and it just shows that, you know, the pandemic just doesn't care. You know, the virus doesn't care. But what it has done is it exposed really vulnerable parts of not only the business, but the economy itself. You know, so businesses are actually being forced to refocus. You know, what what are we doing now that is actually relevant in this kind of, sort of new world that might emerge after the pandemic, after we come out? Um, you know, the pan, like I said, the pandemic is exposing dead parts of the business that didn't, that we were perhaps carrying along for a long time. It was making money or it was making enough money to just tick along and to keep some people employed, to, you know, to manage contracts, for example, but it was never actually making a profit. And so businesses, uh, you know, those kind of parts of the businesses, uh, you know, are, uh, like I said, being exposed by the pandemic for what they are, which is, uh, you know, very precarious, you know, not very good. And so they shouldn't actually survive. Um, not all businesses will survive. And that's a shame. And that's obviously a, a really bad impact on from a personal point of view for that person, you know, for the people involved and from an economic point of view. But again, uh, you know, it's it's it highlights a, a real risk to you know, organizations and the economy and just society in general that we have relied on a lot of service based um, businesses that were obviously relying on other service based businesses as well. So prime example is if 90% of workers or aren't want to go back to uh, an office based environment and 60% of corporate headquarters closed down, what does that mean for all the ancillary services that were built around that? You know, cleaners, uh, people who come in with with food, stock the machines, you know, th those kind of sort of things. Um, all that has a knock on effect. And so it's exposed all those kind of weaknesses in our organizations and in the uh, economy in general. And again, it's, you know, in terms of 
what businesses need to do to refocus is uh, we always tend to sort of focus on things that are closest to our hearts because you know we can't see the wood for the trees and that is we've built this solution you know it's been great it's made lots of money for us you know um but at the same time does the problem still exist or are we just selling it because we can so again the pandemic and and this uh, you know in this situation is kind of forcing us to to rethink you know are we still addressing the problem um, that we set out to do? Is our business still attacking that problem? And if it's not, then what is the new problem that we have to pivot towards? You know, and then how do we build that solution or, or is that solution fit for purpose for this new problem? So again, it's a refocus uh, of what we're, what we're, at, what, you know, what we're intended to do as a business, but what, you know, what is our mission in life again at the same time? You know, and I know I saw this a bit of a jokey slide as well, but you know, who led the digital transformation in your company, COVID-19? Well, yeah, to a certain extent, that's true because it actually forced us to actually transform at, at a pace that has not really been seen before. Um, there are two sort of opposing laws at work or forces at work here. Parkinson's law says work expands so as to fill the time available for its completion. Um, and it's true, we kind of sort of planned projects and said, right, we've got two years to do this. You know, we'll fill up that two years with um, with lots of activities, with lots of requirements analysis, with lots of uh, agile iterations um, and scrum meetings and things like that. And then two years later, we, you know, we'll drop and that's great. And we might make it, we might not. Um, and Duke Ellington famously said, I don't need time, I need a deadline. Well, COVID came along and said, well, your deadline is now. And all of a sudden people were like, right, well, I've, I've not got two years. I've maybe got two months. Um, and funnily enough, you could actually hit those two months. Um, and it just goes to show that um, when you're up against the wall, when you really, really have to change, people can and so can uh, organizations. So I'm hoping that what comes out of this uh, pandemic is certainly a different way and a different attitude towards how we run projects and whether we're actually costing them in the right way, whether we're planning them in the right way, um, and whether we're mindful that something could come along uh, completely left left ball and, and take us out. And so I think that has to be something in the back of our mind from now on. So like I said, projects that took months to start, you know, with project initiation documents, lots of meetings, you know, now took days and weeks to complete. Um, and, the, you know, the, the pandemic is almost like a competitive advantage because, you know, those organisations who can certainly ramp up at speed uh, and deliver projects in such a short space of time um, are going to accelerate well beyond those that kind of sort of uh, meandered along and still wants to take its time and still thinks that projects should be run um, uh, the same way as, as they were before. And again, that's kind of um, refocused need. Um, is there a need for our product and service, um, you know, in, in uh, 12 months time? goes back to one of the earlier slides where it's, uh, you know, the decision I made um, three, six months ago might not be the right decision now. So, and, you know, don't be scared to reevaluate those decisions and make new ones as a result of it. Uh, what products are needed today, tomorrow and next year? Certainly what you're making now, what you're building now might not actually be required in 12 months time because the world has shifted, because the nature of work has shifted, uh, because the economy has shifted. What are the markets and supply chains that you need for today and tomorrow? Well, certainly if I'm going to look towards building products and services, I'm going to need partners um, in regions and, and countries that actually dealt with this situation a lot better than some of the other ones. So, you know, would I go to an Italian supplier, for example, if um, if I knew that a supplier in China or Vietnam or certainly in uh, the Middle East um, who had reacted better to the pandemic could actually supply me um, if such a, a disastrous scenario occurred again. So it kind of help. It's kind of guiding us towards rethinking our relationships and our suppliers, and are they the right people going forward in in a in a, in a, in a world that could change literally on a dime? Um, and again, the ones that do survive, um, our partnerships are going to be growing uh, a lot stronger and a lot faster um, as a result of that because we now trust each other a lot more. So we are here. Um, we are in December, um, the tail end of our, our pretty horrible year for a lot of people. Um, but, you know, the future starts now. Um, it really does. We are seeing a shift um, in how we do things. So the future of work is certainly changing. Uh, the future of leadership 
uh, is certainly changing. Um, the future of organisational makeup is certainly changing. The future of how we perform our jobs is changing and whether we will be performing the same jobs in the future is changing. So literally the future starts now. Um, we are here. What we want to do with that is uh, certainly up to us and certainly up to you in the audience. So I want to thank you all for joining me on this keynote, The Future Starts Now. I really hope you enjoyed it and it was a bit of a whirlwind tour around uh, some of the aspects of uh, the nature of work, what it means to change, what the robots might do um, in terms of uh, our roles, how algorithms are going to change uh, leadership, how we should be treating data, how our organisations are going to change. Hopefully that's going to spark some conversations for the rest of the uh, for the rest of the event. Um, if you have any questions, please do seek me out. Um, you'll find me uh, lurking on LinkedIn and uh, Twitter. Um, and if you're ever more curious, um, you can also pre-order the book. Um, the future starts now. Uh, by myself and Bronwyn Williams. It comes out in April next year um, and you can find it on Amazon, Target, uh, Warriston's, Barnes and Nobles and a few others as well. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure.